And we're back with more of the Pope on Film. Funny! Yes? If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast. I mean, who is it nowadays? It's uh, the talk of the town, sweeping the nation. America's craving some Pope on Film. Here you go. But, uh... <laughs> ah! lower that that was scary it was bunnyception but only the real fans the true hardcore fans of this podcast who have been with us since the beginning back in 2011 when we started as a knitting podcast you remember that bunny yes we were i one still of the don't first understand podcasts. pearl too but yeah uh yeah we we actually recorded 600 episodes just about knitting before we moved into talking about movies, there just seemed to be more to talk about with well, movies. There, there was an, a brief stint of being an exclusive Chris Gaines podcast. Yes. yes. I, his, his music is still amazing. R.I.P. Chris Gaines. R.I.P. But only the real fans of this podcast who've been with us since the beginning, only the real fans would know two facts about the both of us two undeniably really real and in no way made up on the spot facts about the both of us america's hottest podcasting couple bunny and may lynn the first fact about you bunny is that when you are not doing the podcast and i don't think a lot of people know this but when you're not doing the podcast you are a renegade street artist so tell us bunny Yes. What yeah. makes your renegade street artwork stand out from everyone else? Well, I use a, a very uh, high grade textured polymer that you can really only get through special order. Mm -hmm. And I go through the city, and when I find a place that inspires me i use the polymer to sculpt it into what looks like gum hmm. so on a on a particular spot of the sidewalk might be me a, a sculpture of gum and what's funny is people think it's real gum that's yes. the fun because it is just that authentic looking, you know. You see like a lot of under you under see a, a lot of under a railing, yeah. might sculpt a, a bit of gum. So it's very it's very uh it's very controversial. Uh, Banksy has has come out to me personally to tell me how much he, he admires my work. Uh, in in O oh, gum. <laughs> Uh, Banksy came up to me. True story. Tears, tears in his eyes. He yes. came up to me. He said, "Sir, that's what Trump says about everyone." Yes. Bunny's work is currently on display. You can see Bunny's work. Uh, it, real, uh, uh, a lu lucrative deal that Bunny signed to showcase his artwork under tables at your local McDonald's. Yes. Yes. So it, just go to your McDonald's, look under the table. What do you see stuck to the table? Bunny's art. Yeah. Bunny's art. You're yeah. welcome. And it's exclusively, exclusively McDonald's. So if you go to Burger King, and you see the same thing under that? No, that's, that's somebody real else. gum. That's fucking disgusting. Yeah, that's gross. That this is, is gross. high art faux gum. It's art. It's art. People yes. just don't get that. It's art. And the second fact that you would know about me is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a, a storyteller. So what I like to do in this uh, corner of the podcast... <laughs> is I like to take a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know that well, and reword it by my own unique razzmatazz. So that's what this is. 
another educationally uneducational installment of Steve's Historic Approximations. Dun, 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 dun. Or Shep, as I like to call it, repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wants me to or not. Now, personally, I like the name Shep. It's short and direct and to the point, which is kind of like this podcast, except for the short part or the direct part or the whole to the point part. But that's beside the point. And also, it has to continue being Steve's historic approximations. It can't be May Lynn's historic approximations. What's it going to be? Mulhap? That sounds crazy. That's nonsense words. Now, Shap, that sounds like something. That sounds like the noise Indiana Jones whip makes. Shap. That's what it sounds like. It sounds strong. Anywho. Yes, it does. This week on the old Shappity Shap Shap, we will be discussing the 100% true story of the New York City folk singer who absolutely, positively earned the title of ally. And yeah. Uh, Maybe this chap uh, would have been better placed in June, which is Pride Month. But look, them them's the breaks. And and while we're on the subject of allies, um, ev- I am a trans woman. I I there were a million clues that I was a a, a woman that were hidden throughout my entire life. And I didn't realize them until my daughter, Amber, finally just asked me point blank, when I dress up, do I feel like a man who is dressed as a woman or do I feel like a woman? And at that point, a light bulb went over my head and I realized that I was a woman and I saw all of the million clues, the million clues that I had ignored throughout my entire life. And now I I am trans and I'm happy about being trans and I'm proud about being trans. But it it is difficult to wake up every morning and to see even more people who want me dead. Yes. It's tough. It's tough. And there are a lot of people out there, a lot of people that say, I am an ally. I am an ally for, 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 for trans people. But uh it really is time for action because trans people they're being targeted they're being picked on they're being beaten they're being murdered it it it, it really is time to speak up it's time to shit or get off the pot in the in in terms of the word ally it, we need your help we need you to stand up. We need you to be a voice for us and say, uh, hey, if you and if if you're listening to this podcast on, I don't know, uh, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, if you're watching this on iTunes or, or YouTube or whatever, and you don't know a trans person. Hi, my name is Maylin. I'm trans. I'll be your one trans friend so that now you can go around to all of the people you know and say, hey, trans people aren't bad. I know a trans person. And you know what? They're pretty cool. They're a pretty good guy. Well, as of right now. Pretty good girl. Yeah? Eleanor has decided that when they grow up, they want to be a trans woman. Uh, okay. So Eleanor has decided that when she grows up, she's going to be a trans woman. Yes. I tried to explain to her how that doesn't work. But she's insistent in saying, you can't stop me. Okay, so this is this is a weird, this is a weird way to look at things. Eleanor, a naturally born woman, wants to grow up and be a trans woman. That's some straight up Victor Victoria shit. Yes. Wow. Victor Victoria. Yes. I haven't seen that since uh, since uh, 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 <coughs> Hanoi Jane was doing workout videos. And something unusually I found out recently. Mm-hmm. Julie Andrews is still alive. Yeah, she she's 
She's the voice of Gru's mom in the Despicable Me universe. Is that it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, she's been in like two or three Minions movies. It's it's weird. And to the best of my knowledge, Wilfred Brimley is still alive, too. I think he's dead. I'm not sure. I think he's dead. Yeah? I'm not sure. I feel bad not knowing. Okay, so allies. Yes. The ally at the center of this chap is a folk singer named Dave Van Ronk. And some people out there who are watching this live on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Pope on film, or maybe they're listening to it on their favorite uh, podcasting device like Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher. Uh, or maybe uh, you're watching this on YouTube. You might already know the story of Dave Van Ronk. In, in uh, LGBTQ plus circles, this story is uh, semi-famous. But a lot of straights do not know the story of Dave Van Ronk. And that's the whole point of Shaft, to open people's freaking minds. Yes, honey? Wilford Brimley died August 1st, 2020. Wilford Brimley died August 1st, 2020. Ah, uh, okay. And they that's fascinating. got him. Because he made Cocoon in the mid-80s, and he's already looked at death's door then. Yes. Yes, he did. So he lasted he lasted past cocoon and into COVID. I mean, wow. No, barely. Barely, we yeah. Just barely. Here. Just barely. Way to go. Couldn't hang, buddy. <laughs> Couldn't hang with the rest of us. <laughs> Eleanor, you're gonna be a trans woman when you grow up. Yeah. I believe in you. So it's the 1950s and 60s in New York City, and Dave Van Ronk is being hailed as the king of McDougal Street. Okay. And for all of you squares out there in Squaresville, uh, McDougal Street is a one-way street in Greenwich Village that was basically kind of sort of the center of cool bohemian life uh bob dylan had an apartment there uh above the clubs and the bars and the cafes where miles davis would hang out gore vidal willie s burroughs jackie kerouac brando allen ginsburg jack london simon theodore alvin all of the cool people of the day yes gidget all of the cool people you know, they would drink coffee and smoke, and I assume they did cool things like sing numbers from the musical 42nd Street. I don't know what cool people were doing back then. Uh, the Charleston. Yes. Anywho, McDougal Street was the cool place to be. Bob Dylan's first concert was there. Hendrix did a bunch of early concerts there. It was the center of cool in New York City. Like uh, if Soho was a small street where people didn't bathe. And uh, and on that street, McDougal Street uh, and Greenwich Village in general, uh, Dave Van Ronk, poet and folk musician, Dave Van Ronk was the king of McDougal Street. He was the king. He was the guy who knew everyone who held court and who ended up helping a lot of up-and-coming artists out. Uh, Hey, Bob Dylan, maybe smoke some weed or sing about it or whatever. Hey, Joni Mitchell, do you want to play the circle game before you take a big yellow taxi to Woodstock? That's three Joni Mitchell references in one sentence, and I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, Hey, British band The Animals, have you heard my own unique arrangement of the traditional folk song, The Rising Sun Blues? Maybe you could steal my arrangement and become a famous band. That's right! <laughs> Their version of House of the Rising Sun was them saying, hey, let's just do it the way Dave Van Ronk does it in a small coffee shop on McDougal Street. And then that became like one of the greatest songs in the world. Well, I, uh, I yeah. had 
Dave and I Van had Ron. heard recently that nobody really knows what the origin of the House of the Rising Sun is and seems to date back to at least 20, uh, 1929. Yeah. Yeah, the song but nobody sort of... is exactly sure yep. where this song came from or who its original writer was or anything like that. Which can only mean one thing. The song came from the future and someone went back in time and placed it there. Yes. The only logical, only logical explanation It'll be uh, Marty McFly in the remakes. Yeah, yeah. Hey, the animals! It's your cousin! Your cousin, Marvin the Animals? Yeah. <laughs> you know that new song you've been looking for? Well, listen to this! You can do that with anything. That's going to be my new thing. Uh, so this guy, Dave Van Ronk, he legitimately helped uh, give birth to folk music and folk rock. And he, he was the king of McDougal Street. He released well over 30 albums in his lifetime. And although none of them were smash hits, although he, he never became a worldwide celebrity, his behind-the-scenes contributions to American music is absolutely on unparalleled. And also, for reasons that will be important later, I need to mention, he was a straight white man. Okay. He was a straight, white, cishet male. This is an important part of the story. He was some white dude playing... He was some straight white dude getting poontang on McDougal Street playing folk music with Bob Dylan. He was in no way gay or trans or bi or a part of the LGBTQIAA plus rainbow. He was just a cishet straight white dude. That That is important. So, okay. Put a pin on that. Let's put a pin on the story of DVR because we're leaving McDougal Street and heading to Houston Street and then taking that to the Avenue Houston. of the Americas. Huh? Don't, don't make me fuck you up on this point. It what? is Houston Street. Uh, <laughs> Houston Street. Okay. So we're leaving McDougal Street. We're heading to Houston Street and taking that to the Avenue of the Americas past Minetta Playground, taking that to Waverly Place, and then bada-bing, bada-boom, a seven-minute walk later, which isn't that far, seven minutes, not that far, we are at the Stonewall Inn. Now, I don't have time to go into massive detail about the Stonewall riots, so this will really be uh, the Cliff Notes Guide to the Stonewall Riots. Okay. This isn't the history, the complete history of the Stonewall Riots. This is more like uh, uh, a sober, drunk history version of okay. the, the story of the Stonewall Riots. So in the 50s and in the 60s, Life was hard for LGBT people. Gay and lesbians uh, weren't fully considered citizens. They didn't have full rights. They didn't have equal rights. They weren't allowed in government at all because they were considered perverted and thus susceptible to blackmail. Yes. To be fair, you can. It's not like straight people are unblackmailable. Yeah. But, you know, whatever. That's fine. Well, well, uh, well, I no, I just always kind of loved that concept and that idea that we will repress certain people 
so that they must hide. And because that they're basically hiding, they can't have any kind of authority because they're susceptible to blackmail for the closet we've shoved them into. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like, it, yeah. If it didn't have to be hidden, it's not something that you can blackmail somebody about. Yeah. Uh, and okay, so... nobody can nobody can blackmail you for being a trans woman. No, no, no. That's the thing is they don't want it to get out that they're fucking those trans women. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty much it. It's not about the trans women because you can't blackmail a trans woman if she's out and open about it. Exactly. You can't be like, I'm going to tell your secret. Well, the whole fucking world knows. How about I tell your secret that you went down on me last night? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's yeah. the that's the point right there that I'm saying anyway. Yeah. That's yeah. one of the reasons why when I realized that I was trans, I'm just going to be just out in the open about this. This isn't going to be something that I'm going to hide that's going to come and bite me in the ass later. It, it's very difficult to be a trans woman and to be out in the open about it. And I've heard from a lot of other uh, trans people that, that, that sp spend almost the entirety of their lives in a closet, but still consider themselves trans people, but they're scared or they're afraid or they can't come out. And it, it, it's really difficult to be out there. It, it's gotten pretty common to have people attack me on, on social media, which isn't fun, but, it's a small price to pay to try and be out in the open. Like when David Letterman was having sex with with another woman and he and someone said, Dave, I know about you uh, cheating on your wife. So pay me ten thousand dollars or I'll tell everyone. So David Letterman opened up his show by telling everyone that he was having sex with another woman. Yeah, yeah. Like, damn, David Letterman, way to control the narrative. You can't blackmail someone who is just out about everything. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it was a very difficult time to be gay in America. The police and the FBI would keep lists of gay people. And when I heard that, I was like, that's shocking. But then I thought, uh, it wouldn't be surprising if I'm on some lists myself right now, you know? And oh, that wouldn't okay. surprise yeah, me. You, you, you might have picked up some lists, but we have always been on lists. Yeah. There is Especially not with a this time podcast. we have not been on lists. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you what just else? picked the up a Americans? few more. Yeah. The American Psychological Association, Association listed homosexuality as a mental disorder. Uh, in Cuba, they had prison work camps just for gay people. They were basically gay concentration camps. You don't hear people teaching about that. Why would they? That's a, that's a, that would be considered a, a, a piece of trans history, not a piece of uh, hum humans history. It's messed up that well, that happens, but but, but it's it, it's not known. It's not talked about. Acknowledging that it happened would have to mean that they would acknowledge trans people's existence. Yeah, and gay people' existence. Yeah, and and you'll and make and you'll make little white children feel bad. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And cities. Cities would perform sweeps where violent cops would perform violent raids on neighborhoods to try and rid them of gays and lesbians and trans people. And so it's 1969 and the ACAB police are doing a raid of Greenwich Village. This is how back in the day the police would get away with being really violent and arresting all of these gay and trans people is that, hey, we are a, a, a club and we would like to have a liquor license. Okay, here is your liquor license. Wait, is this a club for gay people? You can't have a liquor license because gay people are evil. And if you drank, that would just be more evil. So no gay clubs are allowed to have alcohol. So if, if you go to a gay club, 
uh, a, a lot of these gay clubs would essentially become sort of like speakeasies, you know, where gay people would hang out and, hey, maybe we'll have a drink. And then the police would raid it saying, where's your liquor license? And also a lot of times, a lot of straight people don't want to be in the business of owning a place where gay people can hang out. So a lot of times the mafia would be like, okay, I know that we're horrible and we're killing people, but fuck it. If the gays want to have this building, have this building. This can be your club. And so the police would then say, oh, here's a place where gay people are hanging out. They might be drinking alcohol in there. And also, the mafia probably owns this place. Let's go in with our bats and just start beating the shit out of gays. Yeah. So, it's 1969, and the police are doing a raid of Greenwich Village. They're going into gay and lesbian bars, and they're swinging their batons and bashing in heads and breaking shit. And they go to the Stonewall Inn at 1.20 a.m. on Saturday, June 28th, 1969. And what would normally happen was that the police would, would go in there, they'd, they'd bust some heads, they then they would line everyone up that was in the club. And then they would uh, take a peek and verify your gender, with finger quotes, and if anyone who happened to have a penis was dressed as a woman, they would be arrested. And uh, a lot of times, I really looked into this, a lot of times why the police would do this is because it helped their arrest numbers. Yeah. So, like, you are not that great of a policeman, and you don't do a lot of work, and you haven't arrested that many people. So, okay, then just go to a gay club and start arresting people, because they never fight back. And since gays never fight back, just go and arrest some people. Say, hey, here's this gay person who's doing a gay thing. And I arrested this other gay person and this other gay person. And these two women were kissing. There you go. My arrest numbers are better. I'm going to go eat some freaking donuts now. So, um, so the police go to the Stonewall Inn. They're busting heads, breaking glass. And uh, that night, the trans people, the trans people of color, which is defined, to be clear, a trans person of color is defined as any trans person who's not white. So FYI, I'm, I am a trans person of color, and that's awesome. A and uh, I've got it. I've got it. So the trans people and the trans people of color at the Stonewall Inn, they had enough. They refused to line up. And pretty soon, bricks and bottles started flying all over the place. This was the beginning of the gay pride movement. In fact, the first ever pride march happened on the one year anniversary of the Stonewall riot. So long story short, pride happens every year thanks to Marsha P. Johnson, the black trans woman who threw the first brick that sparked the riot. So it's upsetting in our current time to see uh, not only uh, uh, black people get attacked, but also it's upsetting to see there's a movement within the LGBT plus movement to remove the T from really? LGBT. Yeah, there's a group called the, L the LGB Alliance. Uh, we uh, lesbians and gays and bisexuals need to gather together to make sure that our rights are heard. And to get rid of these groomers. And so there are even gay people who are against trans people now. Yeah. There are even trans people who are against trans people now. Thanks, Kardashians, for that one. Thanks, Kardashians. Hey, what's his name? What's what's her name? Oh, who, who Caitlin. Was... Caitlin yeah. Jenner. Yeah, Caitlin. Okay, so two pins. One pin on the Stonewall riots and one pin on a straight cis white folksy guy, Dave Van Ronk. So let's unpin the both of those. And uh, uh, so it's early a.m. on June 28th. 10 minute morning. Okay, Th that's perfect. It's early a.m. on June 28th, and the king of McDougal Street is eating at a restaurant in Greenwich Village, right? And he's just eating. 
He just eating, I don't know, uh, chicken spaghetti at Chickalini. So let's say he's having a sloppy steak. You know, a big uh, cut of steak with water dripped all over it. it. It's so good. So Dave Van Ronk is eating a sloppy steak. He wasn't gay. He wasn't trans. He was a straight white folk singer eating at a restaurant at, you know, 1.30 a.m. on June 28th, 1969. A, a restaurant he just so happened to be eating at, a restaurant that just so happened to be open very late at night, and uh, a, a restaurant that just so happened to be very close to a certain inn because he's eaten by the window. Suddenly he sees a commotion outside. And Dave Van Ronk says, well, gee, I guess I'll go see what all the fuss is about. So Dave Van Ronk goes outside. He sees a riot happening. He sees gay people and trans people throwing bricks at the cops. And basically, this straight white folk singer essentially goes, well, win in Rome. And he starts throwing shit at the fucking cops. So it, next thing you know, Dave Van Ronk is right in the middle of the Stonewall riots, throwing bricks at police officers. <laughs> like, without thinking, he saw people rioting and he said, hey, I'm not gay, I'm not a lesbian, I'm not trans, this isn't even my fight. It, you know, he, he didn't say, I'm going to go back and eat my sloppy steak. He said, no, these people are in a fight. Here, let me help. I'm going to start throwing bricks. So he, he's throwing bricks and bottles at police. He's caught by police deputy Seymour Pine. He's beaten to near unconsciousness. He's handcuffed to a hot radiator. And after the Stonewall riots finally calmed down, the police arrested 13 people. And one of those arrested at the Stonewall riots, mind you was some straight white folk singer named Dave Van Ronk. And later, when he was questioned about the Stonewall riots, Dave Van Ronk said, anyone who would stand against the cops was all right by me. Yay! Right. Ally! That's right. what that is. That is the definition of ally, and that is what we need right now, especially trans people, non-binary people. This is dangerous for us right now. It's really difficult. It's a difficult mental place to be, to finally yes. have the, to finally reach a point where, oh my God, I've been a woman all this time, and I'm taking uh, hormone replacement therapy. And I'm on estrogen and I'm on a testosterone blocker and I'm working out and I'm eating regularly and I'm feeling good and I'm looking good and I'm looking in the mirror and I'm finally a woman and I'm so happy and I'm, I'm finally living my truth. But also, anytime I leave this house, my life is in danger. Yes. You know, yes. it's a it's a difficult mental place to be, to be trans right now in America because it's dangerous. It is dangerous for me to simply live my authentic life. And that's why everyone out there, gay, straight, we need your help to be a voice for trans people who are constantly getting attacked and marginalized. And, and, and just FYI, gay people, I'm also pansexual and a proud of that and i have a pansexual flag and and i i am i am twice a member of the lgbt rainbow but for all of those uh people who might be gay who might also be anti-trans they're throwing us under the bus first they're coming for you next oh god yes the only way that we can defeat this uh, wave of bigotry and anti-gay uh, fascism and hatred is by banding together, you know? So it, it's, it's important for all of us to be looking out for each other right now. 
but I love this story about Dave Van Ronk. Well, when you think of all the people shit arrested, nobody else is watching out for us. Yeah. You know, I there's love... not a single goddamn politician oh. that, that could give a fuck about what the people want at all. Yeah, if this was the trolley, if a politician was going through the trolley problem, the politician would have their hand on the lever, but also yelling to everybody in the path, look, you've got to vote! Yeah. Sure, I could save your lives, but, you know, this November is the most important election ever. Yes. So that's it for Steve's historical historic approximation this week. I think it's a wonderful story. The yes, story of Dave Van Ronk. I was telling uh, my wife the story of Dave Van Ronk, and halfway through the story, Mal ran out of his room. And, and I'm like, hey, what, 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 what are you doing? What happened? And Mal was just, oh, I know this story. And I'm just really excited to hear you say it. So there's a lot of people who know the story of Dave Van Ronk, but there's a lot of people who don't. Dave Van Ronk's a freaking hero. I've never heard his music, but I love this man. <laughs> so uh, Maybe we'll that's... have to find his music. Yeah, I, I, I think I'll it's have... something to aspire to. Yeah. Because he's an ally. I, I owe it to him. I'll stream him on Spotify. I, I would like to think that if I was having a sloppy steak in, in Greenwich Village, I would have done the same thing. Heck yeah. So that's it for Steve's Historic Approximations this week. Be sure to join us next week for more educationally uneducational fun with Steve's Historic Approximations! Woo! And Cut on that.